have huge benefits. Um, but we'll we'll find out too. So I'm guessing the benefits you're calculating are not your mental health. No, no. There. <laughs> Although it will be nice to like <laughs> to clean out an attic that. Well, it won't be nice to clean out an attic that's 120 years old. Welcome to the Fine Home Building Podcast, our weekly discussion of building, remodeling, and design topics aimed at anybody who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses. This is Senior Editor Patrick McComb. Today I'm joined by Editorial Director and Director Andrew Zellner. You here, Andrew? Yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm here. <laughs> Operations Manager for TDS Custom Construction, Ian Schwant. I'm here, Patrick. Good to see you, Ian. And producer, Jeff Rose. I'm always here. (laughs) (laughs) Please email your questions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. You can find previous podcasts and check out the show notes at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. Well, gents, thanks for being here this morning. Happy to be here. Nice and early central time. Yeah, it is. We're we're, we're doing an early start so I can uh, go on a photo shoot later in the week. Thanks for doing this. What have you been working on, Ian? How's the new job? Uh, New job is good. Uh, Really keeping an eye on lumber prices right now. We have a bunch of additions in the hopper that we're going to get prices out for and get started on. And and things have really started to climb in the last couple of weeks. Uh, Do we know why? I think it had a lot to do with the trucking and transportation disruption in Canada. So that that leg has caught up to supply here. Uh, we're seeing two by four studs up over ten bucks again. Uh, we're all, all just shaking our heads. <laughs> yeah, those two, of you listening, it's just like two two by tens are are over sixty dollars uh, again. So it's uh, a lot of the stuff that we use pretty regularly is has shot back up in the last couple of weeks. And then you throw gas prices on top of that and. Prices for plumbing and electrical. Uh, Can I ask a, a simple well. question? How do you not go broke uh, bidding jobs that you have commodity pricing? Uh, you know, what it's do you really do? It's really tough. Uh, I have a, a portal that I can use to price things to the minute with one of our uh, larger uh, lumber building material supply houses that we use. That's really helpful. Uh, otherwise, it's it's just really communicating well with our subcontractors and our vendors, and and having something in our contracts that if you know lumber would double overnight, that we can go back to the the clients and have that conversation with them. How uh, long do you give your clients to sign on the dotted line when you have uh, price fluctuations like we're seeing? Typically, our contracts are usually sewn up within two weeks of ending the the design and estimating process. Uh, One of the things that I want to start looking into is pre-buying some of this material as soon as we sign contracts. Uh, If it looks like the the futures price is going to start increasing as much as it looks like it will right now. Do you have to take delivery on that stuff you order or do you hope the vendor will hold on to it until you need it? Oftentimes, we'd have to take delivery of it, but with things like uh, floor trusses or roof trusses, if you sign up with your uh, components manufacturer and pay them whatever their upfront fee is to hold the price, uh, they would hold uh, what they quoted you when you priced the project. Hmm. Well, I don't envy you trying to figure this all out with... uh... (laughs) It's a lot of math. Yeah. It's a lot of math constantly. Different math than carpentry. So, so do you use a spreadsheet to, to track all this stuff? I Is that got yeah. a bunch of different ones? I have my own like Dow Jones basket of goods that we use that I fill <laughs> out uh, monthly and I have a little index number that I can track and uh, it's it climbed up quite a bit in the last 30 days. Hmm. Are other commodities going up similarly, like uh, copper and, you know, things that would affect the building business? Yeah, one of my uh, things on my remodeling goods index is half-inch copper pipe, and uh, that's been steadily climbing. Uh, PVC pipe, at least as far as what I check, has been holding pretty steady. 
Uh, Romex seems to add, you know, two percent every time I check it. You know, goes up from ninety to ninety-five to a hundred to one hundred and five, and now it's at a hundred and ten for a roll of twelve two. Aren't you tempted to like buy all your stock at the local home center and you know do your own little commodities game, sell it back to the company? <laughs> <laughs> no, that that seems like it'd be even more work. <laughs> How about you, Andrew? What have you been doing? Have, has uh, cost price increases affected your remodeling? Uh, so uh, a little bit. Um, you know, I've I've pretty much finished, you know, air sealing uh, my basement, got all my foam on the walls, um, you know, cut very specifically to size in my rim joists, spray foam stuff. So I st- um, I'm going to stop you. Uh, yeah. You know, the cut and cobble thing we talk about a lot on the show, is that something you enjoy or do you find it to be drudgery? Uh I took joy at the beginning because I was like, hey, my house is going to be warmer. <laughs> then you reach the drudgery. <laughs> and then this last weekend, I like I reached the point in the project where like I, I need to do a little bit more, but I've got to also like run my uh, radon mitigation system outside and it's still cold. And so like the other part of the basement is ready to start being finished. And so I, I actually uh, on Friday night, I went to Home Depot and, and bought my two by fours. I paid about eight bucks, you know, for eight foot two by four. Um, and like by Sunday night I had like framed out a room in, in my basement and it, it felt so good. It was just like, <laughs> there were, I felt like there was no progress and all, and all of a sudden they're like, Oh, this is going to be a room. And like, I can throw some insulation in, in those walls and, um, and finish them, you know, like. Boy, framing is heartening. Uh, <laughs> it is. It, it's it, yeah. It, it's like the amount of progress you see like and how quickly it goes. And like, there's still, you know, I'm, I'm in a basement, it's an old house. So there's a lot of like playing with lasers and plumbing walls and like, it's fussy um, work compared yeah. to new, new building. Right. Yeah. It's, it's still fussy work, but not as fussy as, you know, trying to stick your head into weird spaces and like <laughs> get a foam gun where you need it to go and all that kind of stuff. Jeff, does this hearken memories for your own home projects, uh, oh, yeah. hearing Andrews uh, as yeah. a first-time homeowner? Oh, God. Yeah, that, that was a <laughs> long time ago. What do you think is the most satisfying, like, DIY stuff you can do? I mean, you know, the, the biggest wow factor is framing. It's like, you know, you you stand up a wall and it's like, boom, it's a wall. Yeah. The, uh, the other thing um, that happened, you know, after I was on the podcast last time was I finally finished in like installing all of the, fi- the fixtures in my half bath um, that I'm doing downstairs. And now I just like I forget that we have this extra bathroom. So I'm still like <laughs> a walk right by it to run upstairs, you know, like. So I have yeah. to ask you, did the, the fixture install go right the first time? It it did. Um, I mean, just uh, we've got a little wall mounted sink um, that, you know, was like it, it all like I'd been plumbed already. And so I just had to, you know, hook it up. Um, and then the toilet, actually, it's a, a Kohler uh, toilet. And like I, I'd done my research and I've like pulled and like replaced toilets before. Um, but like this, the the system is really slick. It's just like you've got this plastic plumbing piece that you put your wax ring on and secure it to your flange. And then the toilet, you just sat on top of it. And it, it holds and, the bolts for you? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah cool. And then, then you just have to tighten everything up. And I like I, I bought like a couple extra wax rings and was like, I don't, you know, I don't know how this is going to go. And it just took like 10 minutes. It was so it was Isn't so it great. great when that happens? Yeah. yeah. The, I mean, the hardest part was just like maneuvering a toilet, you know, like put it all together and it weighs, you know, 150, 200 pounds and. I think you're yeah. uh, exaggerating there because <laughs> <laughs> there's no way I could pick up a 150 pound toilet. Yeah, yeah. I, that's what I think. Manufacturers have gotten better about making them easier to install. Now they give you like plastic wrenches and stuff that are meant to tighten the tank to the bowl. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it's it's way easier than it used to be. It made me want to replace the other toilet we have because well, this new one like works so much so much better. <laughs> Does it use less water? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, we have got a Kohler in our upstairs bathroom, and it's like 1.9 or 1.8 gallons. This one's 1.26 or something. So, cool. Yeah, Jeff, have you had any projects? Not really. No, just working on taxes. 
exciting stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love that, as you can imagine. So t- uh, this past weekend, oh. I, I put the uh, graspable handrail up on my uh, stairway and uh, almost regretted it immediately uh, because, I don't know, it just broke up the whole feng shui of the whole thing. And it's, it's up there now, but I don't know. I guess the part that troubles me most is um, unless you have a round handrail, you can't turn corners uh, and have the things plane out, right? Uh, you can't go slope up and turn a corner <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, without making a bending rail, I suppose. Um, yep. mm-hmm. So that uh, that's well, I, a man has to know a man's limitations, and that is way <laughs> beyond what I'm capable of. So I think I'm going to live with it now, uh, adopting the Ian. It's done for good now, uh, good enough for now uh, kind of philosophy. But what I really think I need to do is buy that welder and learn how to weld steel tubing, right? Because that's the way to to do that and have it look lighter visually than you could do with wood and those brackets and stuff. I thought you would just go over by uh, your friend Matt Kenny's and get out a big block and cut it up on the bandsaw and make your own (laughs) transitional part for your rail. I still don't know what the stereotomy uh, thing is about, right? <laughs> Patrick Moore could have to explain yeah. this to me how to do it, I'm sure, but... Uh, I could yeah. send you one of my old books on tangent handrailing, and that would really... <laughs> I think you'd probably start losing your hair if you tried to understand some of the drawings in those books. So what I find interesting is, of course, um, the folks who are really good at that you know, sketch out the transitions on the block of wood and then, and then carve them, right? That's all hand work or they use a bandsaw. Um, but you have to be able to, to do that in your head, I imagine. But allegedly that stereotomy method allows folks who are less visual to, to do that work, right? It's a mathematic uh, approach to those problems. Right. And it's a way to show it kind of laid out in the flat, uh, like you'd be used to looking at a diagram of a roof rafter. Have any of you used those techniques to make stuff? I used the... I used Everyone's the shaking stere- their head again. <laughs> no. I used the stereotomy uh, technique on the connection between my house roof and my garage roof because it, it actually has uh, the two different pitches where it connects. So my, it connects my house to the garage. The house at that point is, uh, I think that's 412 and the garage is five. So I did actually use that technique to lay out uh, how I would cut my rafters. And I completely butchered it, but it, it got me a lot closer <laughs> than, than guesswork. Well, I'm going to appeal to our, our listeners, as I often do. If any of you out there are good at... Uh, handrails and balustrades, you know, that's great content for the magazine and the website. It always has. That stuff is really hard. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, you know, you could help us conquer the learning curve, I would be supremely grateful. And I promise I'll make it as easy on you as possible. Yeah. And now that Bob Goodfellow is no longer our art director, I don't have the uh, (laughs) intense fear to do staircase uh, features (laughs) in fine home building. The guy that did the uh, other fine home building house in 2021 with mine, the guy from Nebraska, whose name I, I'm drinking on. No, Travis is 2022. Uh, Jason? Uh, yes. Uh, he actually has a, a pretty awesome Instagram video up of him doing a, a curved staircase. And it's like in time lapse. It, it's pretty impressive to watch. I would say it's the pinnacle of finished carpentry, people who are good at that. Yeah. I mean, they, mm-hmm. they is, there's carpentry and then there's that, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, we got uh, some feedback on our discussion about hanging uh, cabinets on steel studs, which we apparently completely got wrong. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this comes from Ben Scott, who is a uh, fine home building contributor and works for Stickle uh, Cabinets and Millwork in British Columbia. And uh, he says, uh, hey, Patrick, hope you're doing well. I was listening to the podcast and had to write to tell you guys the easy and correct way to hang cabinets on steel studs on new builds. Myself or the contractor installs either two-by material or three 
quarter inch plywood bands of backing in between the steel studs for the cabinets to screw into before drywall is hung. If we go into an existing space, I'll cut out an area of drywall that will be covered by the cabinets or the bed ledger that the original podcast question was about and put plywood ba backing between the studs screwed through the face of the flange and through the edge of the stud besides and then reinstall the drywall. If it's an exterior wall, I'll cover the joint with Canadian tuck tape for air control. For folks who don't know, that's a like red uh, tape that they use to seal polyethylene uh, for uh, an air barrier. And it smells uh, like maple syrup. Does it really? No. <laughs> <laughs> that would be too cool. <laughs> have you used this stuff? You're, you're close enough to the border that you might have it uh, locally. Uh, I, I haven't seen it in any of mm. our, our stores. Uh, he says, time. then I run uh, full, ba uh, full run of backing to attach the cabinet or whatever I'm attaching to the wall. I never really rely on any screw holding into the steel studs as the plywood backing is clamped to the drywall. There's a drawing attached for reference, and I'll put that on the podcast page so folks can see how Ben does that. Didn't we say that's how to do this? Did, did we get this wrong? Uh, we got it pretty close. Um, I I would say that the, the real meat of what he said is not relying on the steel stud, which is, I think, what we said in a very convoluted yeah. uh, way. At the very end, like yeah. you, you could have tuned out by the time we got to that part, <laughs> right? It was too long of a steel framing discussion for, <laughs> for the fine home building podcast. Uh, we got more on this from Greg in West Marin, California. Hey, Patrick and crew, I just finished listening to the last podcast and the question about steel studs. I had two thoughts. The first, who are the people who have time to watch the YouTube of this? I usually listen to the podcast when I'm either in my van on my way from one job to another or getting materials at the orange box store at night so I can keep working when the sun isn't shining. The second and more relative thought was finding it ironic that they talk about how to use the steel studs came after a discussion about how easy it is to repair drywall. Why not just rip out the whole drywall and either insert solid wood into the steel studs or cistern with regular studs and then drywall it back up? It's almost always e easier to patch big drywall sheets than little tiny squares. I've seen homeowners spend uh, 20 minutes spreading mud around a broken drywall around an outlet. It's much quicker just to take out a chunk in between the studs, sister and add some blocks and screw the drywall in so you're not trying to cram through two rows of screws on one side and you have a nice stable piece of drywall to finish and lots of space to share your blood compound to. I don't know if that was like <laughs> mistranslated from Siri or whatever, but I just <laughs> left it because I'm like, that kind of describes drywalling for me, right? Blood compound. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it, it might become part of our uh, fine home building lexicon, like greedy dormer or over trucked, right? <laughs> uh, sorry about any typos. I'm dictating this to Siri while I'm driving from one job to do an estimate on another. Cheers, Greg, West, West Marin, California. P.S. Yes, my therapist talks to me about work life balance also. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's fantastic. That's a lot to dictate to Siri while you're driving. And if blood <laughs> compound is the only typo, <laughs> it, that's pretty good. And, yeah, and, and I don't think we're convinced it's a typo. I'm, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, David from YouTube has an oversimplification for us. Uh, if you have a small wood shop and need to heat it when you are in it, you have too little insulation. Is that right? I mean, come on. I think he's saying you're not working hard enough if you're in there and you need it to be uh, heated. Okay. I, that makes more sense. All right. So if you're hand planing, you're not cold, right, Andrew? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Or although, he thinks, although I'd say your hands and your cold plane are probably cold. <laughs> or he thinks you're in there hiding from your family <laughs> and not actually doing anything. Yeah. Well... Who hasn't done that? <laughs> <laughs> Patrick's thinking, isn't that what a workshop I'm like is trying for? to think when I'm not doing that. <laughs> uh, uh, this comes from Sean. Hey, FHB podcast. I have some feedback and suggestions regarding the comment about the freezing well pit. Sorry for the link, but I think it could help a lot of people. My grandmother lives in a rural area with no municipal water and she has wells on her property. Her well house is a small four by eight brick box, maybe three foot tall. 
It's not insulated, and she is always worried about it freezing during cold weather. She's in her 90s and is tough as nails, but always walked out in the freezing weather to check on the pipes in the middle of the night, which required removing the 100-pound cover. Boy, that lady's tough. Uh, I came across a thermostatically controlled outlet, uh, and he has an Amazon link here. It's only 15 bucks, and it comes... Uh, it comes on at 35 degrees and shuts off at 45. My understanding is that these are intended for heater elements for cow water troughs to prevent freezing. It's a standard fixture that plugs into any three prong receptacle. It's not truly designed for exterior applications, but is marked as home and farm applications such as pond deacers, unheated rooms, pump houses, greenhouses, boats and RVs. And as you will see below has lasted for over six years. It has two receptacles, so I plug in two separate halogen lights on opposite sides of the pump house. It adds redundancy, but also more heat. Now all my grandma has to do is look out her window and see if the light is on when it's cold at night. Because it is temperature controlled, the halogens runs for short periods of time, and the same two halogen bulbs have been working flawlessly for six years. I found the halogen bulbs more robust than, and economical than heating bulbs. Uh, on a related note, my mom moved into a new house recently with an exterior water heater, which concerned me with the Austin freezing and massive loss of external tankless water heaters. I plan on wrapping pipe heating cables around the interior of the tankless heater away from anything combustible. I'll plug the heater cord into a thermostatic outlet. When she knows it will be below freezing outside, all she will have to do is run an extension cord from a nearby outlet and plug in the uh, heater. Provided she does not lose power, this will run and ensure that tankless heater pipes never freeze. So that was the problem, though, in Texas, right? All the power went out. So this, this plan would not work. You'd have to plug into a generator. Do you guys find it crazy that parts of the country have water heaters on the outside of their house? Very. I'm sure. Yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's <laughs> weird. You're talking to two guys that live in the upper Midwest here, Patrick. <laughs> yeah, we, we can't fathom that. The first, first time I saw that, I think, was in Oakland, California, and it just, like, completely baffled me. And the other thing I saw there for the first time was, like, waste stacks on the uh, outside of apartment blocks, right? Because uh, it doesn't need to be inside, and why waste the, the space? Uh, it just blows my mind. I mean, sometimes I feel like it's crazy that I, I even go outside during the winter, <laughs> you know? Like, <laughs> it gets cold. Um, Sean uh, goes on to say, this could easily be adapted to powered uh, AC adapters. The pipe heater cord draws only 42 watts per hour with a six-foot cord. Uh, it would be 21 watts for a three-foot cord. Even with a four-amp, 18-volt battery, this would provide a few hours of continuous runtime to get through the night as it would likely not be running continuously due to the 35 on and 45 off temperature settings. Uh, in extreme off-grid situations, a small solar panel and car battery could likely run this virtually indefinitely, depending on the space and halogen lights. Hopes, hope this helps anyone who has freezing concerns. Thanks, Sean, JD, MBA. So I had to look up uh, what JD is. Do you guys happen to know what that professional designation is? Doctor of Jurisprudence. Yeah, it's like a PhD for attorneys, right, Jeff? Yep. I'm always amazed at the people who listen to this show. I really... <laughs> His uh, point about uh, extreme off-grid conditions is interesting with the, the amount of people doing things like uh, A-frames out in the, the woods that are off the grid and things like that. So it does become something you have to be concerned about. Well, and it's like how long until we see, you know, a small solar panel included with the purchase of your tankless electric water heater, you know? It's, uh, I had a couple coworkers who lived off grid, uh, in my career. And, uh, this is a huge problem, uh, pumping water, uh, having things freeze. Uh, a lot of folks try and rely on gravity, but, uh, when things are super cold, those systems are unreliable. It's, it's, uh. Gravity gets unreliable when it gets cold. <laughs> <laughs> I said those systems get unreliable. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and doesn't it seem, Andrew, like people always want to live off the grid in really nasty cold places like up by us? Well, I think that's because that's the only space available where you can right. get off grid. All the nice places have people in them already. Yeah. The other alternative is to go like to the Southwest and uh, then you have water that's like 2,000 feet down, right? Or it needs to be trucked in. It's, yeah. 
Yeah, winter is our price to pay for easy access to water in the upper Midwest. And low real estate prices, I would argue. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we established before that you live in Greenwich, Patrick, your, your Freudian slip the last time I was on here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> this comes from Jim, FHB podcast crew. I'm writing to you again with another question. I really appreciate all the help you've given me every time I've sent a question. I'm in the process of remodeling our master suite and family room where the interior was gutted down to the studs. I've re-insulated with mineral wool and Tello Plus installed as my vapor retarder, and I'm doing final prep for drywall. The Intello Plus install recommends furring out the wall and ceiling after Intello is, is installed, which I believe is done to protect it during drywall installation, since the intent was to make the assembly as airtight as possible. My question is, what is best practice to fasten the furring strips to the wall and ceiling? I've read online that screws are best when used when the nail or when the load will be in the same direction as the screw, but if the load is in shear, then it's best to use nails. So should I use screws on the ceiling and nails on the wall? Am I overthinking this? I've been accused of that many times. I spent a lot of time and money on this project, so I just want to ensure I'm doing everything correctly to avoid any issues down the road. Thanks again, Jim. So is Jim overthinking this? Ian, I'll let you go first. I'll take the Intello part first. <laughs> uh, the, the reason they suggest doing that furring is so that you can run your mechanicals on the interior side of that vapor barrier. And then you don't have to air seal all of your uh, receptacle boxes or any other mechanical penetration that you'd have going through the Intello. Because otherwise you have to tape the Intello to all of your boxes. You have to tape the back of the box and you have to yeah, air but seal. I'm sorry, maybe I'm not understanding, but your, your cables wouldn't be in the wall far enough if you were only relying on the three quarter inch strapping to space the drywall away, right? If you look at 475's website, I believe they show it being done with two by fours uh, uh, mm. oftentimes. And then uh, you do have to use a special receptacle box for the three quarter inch furring strips. But I believe that's that's why they show that. Uh, I've seen plenty of instances where the drywall is just installed directly over a vapor barrier like Intello. Mm. Also, screws or nails. Or overthinking. I, would, I, I think you're overthinking it, but I wouldn't. I don't know if I would use nails on the ceiling. I think I would would use some kind of uh, GRK screw or heavy duty screw. Um, but on the walls, I'm not sure that I would care either way. You got thoughts on this, Andrew? Uh, I'm a, a big proponent of construction screws. You know, like it, the cost for a couple of rooms isn't sig that significantly more than nails and especially if you're doing stuff yourself, it's easy to back them out and redo things. And, um, I'm, yeah, I, I, I would say he is likely overthinking this as we all tend to do. Um, and I'd say screw, I'd, I'd go screws. I'd say it doesn't matter. Ring shank nails. Holy crap. Have you tried to pull those out of anything <laughs> ever? I mean, the head snap off before the nail comes out. Thinking about the nails. I, I'm, Thinking too about the speed of of using a nail so gun much faster. And, oh my gosh! Uh, I think I think it was Kevin Ireton that said to me that the first time he used a nail gun when he was a carpenter in the eighties <laughs> was like seeing God. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> this yes. is one of the greatest lines I've ever heard from another carpenter. He's so right, though. I mean, I I remember that too. My first Stanley Bossage N80S. Oh my. God, that was so amazing. It was so impossibly dangerous, but also so awesome. <laughs> and it weighed as much as Andrew's toilet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, do whatever you want, man. If you have a nail gun, I'd say do that. If you like the screws, th that's great too. Uh, admittedly, uh, I think Andrew's point is the best, that if you want to take something down because you made a mistake or you want to change something yep. or you decide you want to tweak the location of the strapping because you want to move an electrical box or whatever, yeah, trying to get those nail out, nails out, forget about it. Um, yeah, I don't know about the, like, I'm wondering about the cost too. And, uh, Andrew's point is that if you're only doing a couple rooms, it's no big deal. But if you're doing a whole house, like it's going to yeah. be hundreds of dollars for screws, yeah. right? 
Yeah, you can buy screws in bulk at most of the home centers, and that that does drastically reduce the price. Um, I think I probably bought like 10 of those giant bulk boxes of GRK screws while working on the house because they they did become the thing that was easiest to use for temporary bracing or or anything like that, and even for the people helping me to to screw things together and instead of nailing them. I you know I can look at adhesives and screw uh, improvements in my career uh, as like life changing uh, advances. Honestly, the the quality of screws and what you can do with them now is staggering, and like the ability to fasten a ledger reliably without drilling any holes or. <laughs> <laughs> It's crazy. We will be right back after this word from our sponsor. This episode of the Fine Home Building Podcast is brought to you by Jobber. If you run a home service business like painting, contracting, lawn care, or cleaning, your to-do list is endless. From hiring staff to mountains of paperwork, not to mention doing the actual work that pays the bills, Jobber is a mobile and online app that helps you organize your business and look professional. With Jobber, you can quote jobs, schedule your crew, invoice and get paid all in one place. Try it free today at jobber.com. This comes from Ryan. Hi, FHB podcast team. I love the podcast. You've transformed my long commute into an amazing applied slash graduate school experience in building science. We all appreciate your work. I'm remodeling my 1930s era home in Seattle. The home has two by four walls with lath and plaster, three quarter inch board sheathing, a black plastic like WRB, remember it's the 1930s, and brick veneer. I've been a builder and remodeler for years but am less experienced with energy retrofitting brick clad homes. Most houses around here aren't brick. The home has no insulation in the walls and a very thin layer of bats in the attic. I'm vaulting the ceiling and installing rigid foam ventilation in the new 2x12 rafters and will add a layer of rigid foam on top of the sheathing when I do the roof to get ready for solar uh, panels. My goal is to get the home to pretty good house recommendations of 20, 40, 60 insulation levels, but I'm trying to be realistic slash efficient. Uh, so uh, 20, I don't know. Is that... Basement. Uh, below basement and then 40 walls and 60 is roof, right? Yep. yep. That's what I did for my house. Um, my question is about the planned wall assembly. To get to R40-ish in my walls, I was planning on a double stud wall with dense packed cellulose, but I have some concerns. I've read Martin's Musings of an Energy Nerd and everything I can find on fine home building and GBA. I am familiar with the concerns about double stud moisture issues on the interior of cold exterior sheathings in homes where exteriors don't have rigid foam or rain screens. I'm also familiar with some arguments, example, Ben Bogey, that these concerns are overblown and that with good air sealing and attention to detail, the double stud dense packed cellulose wall performs just fine. This article from Building Science was also urging away from double stud walls, but all of the provided alternatives either call for exterior rigid foam or interior spray foam. I'm planning to leave the brick veneer in place and I'm wondering if you have any recommendations for the wall assembly, especially how to address these possible moisture concerns for the, from the interior. I wanna stay away from spray foam for ecological and cost concerns. <clears throat> Should I, number one, go ahead with a double stud wall with dense packed cellulose and taped slash painted drywall as my air barrier? Two, leave the existing two by four lath and plaster in place and blow in cellulose. Three, some version of Joe Steebrook's double stud wall with a layer of plywood in the middle of my double stud wall to reduce slash air vapor control. Uh, four, some other idea I'm not considering. Thanks again. The podcast is super focused, helpful, positive, and we all look forward to it. Ryan, super focused, Ryan. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if we're listening to the same show, but hey, thank you for the kind words. Oh my goodness. This is a great question. I think the wrinkle here is the brick veneer and the board sheathing. Am I right? Yep. You could argue <laughs> that the, the brick veneer does have something of a rain screen behind it probably but you don't that's know unreliable how, because folks, unreliable. especially yeah. uh in the day didn't clear out the mortar droppings and there was no provision True. uh in the bottom of the wall to uh provide right. drainage uh that that good 
uh, masonry veneer walls have today. That's a good point. Uh, we don't know, regrettably, and I should have asked Ryan, if this house has good overhangs, because I think that has a lot to do with how this wall is going to perform in his rainy climate. So the, the first thing that I wrote down in my notes on this one was ventilate, 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 because that was what Ben Bogey told me when I visited the house <laughs> that he was building in, in Maine, was that the, the key to the double stud wall is to keep the moisture down inside your house. So... Like you said, overhangs, exterior drainage, making sure that your basement stays dry, taking care of any moisture that you, your house plants, your cooking uh, bring into the house uh, goes a long way into making that assembly work, even though the physics say it probably shouldn't work. What do you think, Andrew? Uh, <clears throat> so I've... I've done a lot of thinking about this too. Granted, I don't have brick veneer um, on on my house, but it is two by four walls, no insulation, plaster and lath on the inside. You have board sheathing, I presume? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Board sheathing, then cedar, uh, wood siding, and then asbestos shakes. And so like, I'm really trying not to do anything to the exterior sure. of the house. <laughs> um I so I also have been going down the like thought experiment of like just air sealing really really well and insulating walls as like I remodel um and I like I know there like R40 in walls is like an admirable uh thing to get to um but like the practicality in a remodel gets gets kind of nuts as as a uh, as our, our reader, Ryan, is, is talking about. Um, Especially in a mild climate like Ryan's. You yeah. know, Seattle is mm -hmm. very mild. It's not like where you guys are. Right. Or me, even in Greenwich. It's totally different. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's also, you know, pretty good house is, you know, it's a standard, but it's also dependent on climate. And, um, you know, maybe by not going R40 in the walls and doing something a little simpler um, will perform just as well. And you can, you know, move that R value somewhere else or, or you know, it's not it's not all about the wall, as as Ryan knows, too. I th I worry about reservoir claddings and board sheathing uh, and then lots of insulation because the drying potential is so much reduced. And, uh, you know, I don't know if Ryan is planning central air conditioning for his house, but, you know, if he is and you have uh, sun baking your brick veneer, it's going to drive all that moisture through the board sheathing. And the coldest thing it's going to get to is the back of the drywall. And uh, that seems very risky to me. And Seattle, with it being a, a wet climate as well the reservoir cladding is going to take on a lot of water but don't they only have like five sunny days a year in Seattle or something <laughs> like that? that that's going to cause that drive so I've heard that too but I've also heard that anyone who's visited Seattle in the summer says it's absolutely gorgeous all the yeah. time and Seattleites probably just tell the rest of us that to keep us away I bet that's what it is it's kept yeah. me away so it's working <laughs> Um, Ryan, I think you might want to dial back your, your wall uh, insulation levels. And um, one of the things I've seen folks do, uh, which makes a lot of sense to me, is when you have board sheathing and these kind of assemblies, if you take 30-pound felt paper and fold it into a three-sided uh, U or a five-sided U, it's not a U anymore, but you put little flanges on your piece of felt paper and you staple it to the sides of the suds, and that becomes your air barrier and it does allow some drying the other way when it needs to, but it also um, stops bulk water and hopefully a lot of vapor drive from getting through from the masonry into the wall assembly. He could but that's also, generally, if he's, go if ahead. He's, yeah. If he's going to open the walls and do that, Patrick, he could also go with mineral wool, which is a type of insulation that will handle that water a little better than uh than cellulose or fiber. And it's real vapor but, open, so like yeah. it can dry either way, right? Yep. And, and I think we want to keep plastic out of this assembly for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And at that point, he could fur the studs out to be of two by six depth 
uh, and get that little bit extra of mineral wool. And I think that would get them up into the R20s, uh, which, as you put, might be good enough for Seattle climate. Yeah, I this is a tough one, Ryan, and maybe some of our other listeners will weigh in on what you should do. But I think scale back in your uh, energy goals and uh, maybe put more insulation in your attic, which would help more arguably. Um, or, you know, do something else to make your house more uh, resilient, uh, you know. I'd be really concerned about getting into some of the, the really highly engineered stuff like Stebrick's double wall with plywood in between. Uh, you could just be running the risk of spending a lot of money on unnecessary building materials at that point. And Ryan, you have plans to put PV on your roof anyway. Maybe you buy some more PV to offset the, you know, energy, slight energy consumption uh, boost from, you know, your lower R values. It's a good exercise. So what have you decided you're going to do, Andrew? Uh, I, I haven't really decided anything yet. Um, you know, my, the, the, the big projects, air sealing, the basement, and you get a lot of like cold air stack effect stuff going on. Cause I've got a leaky house. Um, you know, once I, I feel like I've got a window, like sort of like March through end of April, um, the I've, I've got like four inches of insulation <laughs> in my attic. Um, and so I want to do, I want to remove that insulation and air seal and then re-insulate. Um, and that's, it's like taking it in steps too, is like, I, I think doing that, uh, to, to my attic will have huge benefits, um, but we'll, we'll find out too. So I'm guessing the benefits you're calculating are not your mental health. No, no. <laughs> although it will be nice to like, <laughs> to clean out an attic that, well, it won't be nice to clean out an attic that's 120 years old, but it'll be nice to be able to evaluate the entire attic, you know, having only spent time up there hunting squirrels, um, you know, <laughs> like I, I didn't, I didn't get eyes on the whole thing. And so they're like, I, I think, you know, health and, um, yeah, and you know, environment-wise, um, insulating the attic is going to go a long way. And then, once the basement's insulated, the attic's insulated, then then I'll think more about the walls. Does your uh, wiring date to the uh, first uh, incarnation of your house, or has that been updated? Uh, it's it's been updated. Um, I discovered sort of the last little bit of knob and tube when I was doing my kitchen remodel. And so everything from the box to all the outlets in the house is all Romex now. You're very lucky to not have to deal with that <laughs> up in your attic. Holy crap. Yeah. Well, Ryan, I'm sure that wasn't helpful at all. Um, <laughs> but let us know if you what you do. I'm curious. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see what his closing of his next letter is going to be because that wasn't Super focus, focus, helpful, <laughs> or positive. So. And we trashed his hometown. Yeah. Uh, this comes from Chris. Greetings. Ian, congrats on your promotion. You must have a passion for home building and remodeling if you're able to take on more work nine to five and do the podcast and respond so thoughtfully to listener questions. So we should tell folks you've been having an ongoing discussion with Chris about his new build. Uh, yep, you guys have seemed to hit it off, uh, and yeah. you seem to be equally nerdy in regard to your uh, assemblies, right? Yeah, and uh, equally nerdy into the financial end of building a house. He's, sure. Uh, he, he hit the same wall I hit early on in the process of, <laughs> oh, my God, this is going to cost way more than I thought. What am I going to do? Why didn't I listen to Patrick and build a simpler house? Uh, so, yeah, I've been been having a lot of good back and forth with Chris on that. We'll have to uh, ask more about that discussion here as we get to his question. I have a pile of questions regarding insulation and other topics. I'll list them below. Let me know if it's more appropriate to send new questions through the FHP uh, email address. I don't intend to fill your respective inboxes with marginal questions. Also, I'm an FHB All Access member now. Woo! Thank you, Chris. Hear that, everybody? Um, so if there's a resource I can access to answer these questions, please let me know. I'm happy to dig in. Uh, I'm feeling pretty good with my plan for the above grade envelope. I think I have my control layers in all planned out for the upcoming build. My exterior walls will be vinyl siding with a rain screen, one by three treated furring, fully taped zip R6, open cell spray foam between the studs, drywall, and a vapor retarder paint slash air sealing. 
My roof attic ceiling will be uh, asphalt shingles, fully taped zip sheathing, trusses, vented attic with baffles, 16 inches of blown cellulose, drywall, ceiling paint, and air sealing. There's one question resulting. I have heard zip R sheathing can be in short supply. My architect suggested selecting an alternative rigid foam for the builder to use in the event my zip R is not available. Given that the exterior of the zip R is the WRB, the foam should remain inside the sheathing. My understanding is that the attached foam is polyiso, which is the keep it warm insulation. I'd imagine replacing R6 with an equivalent polyiso would have the same effect, yes? Okay, so let's first uh, tackle his assemblies. Um, you pointed this out in your correspondence. We don't need a rain screen with vinyl siding, right, Ian? Nope. And even if you were doing the rain screen, I don't think that you would need to pay the premium for treated furring. I certainly didn't on mine. And I can tell you that vinyl siding manufacturers are not jazzed about you putting vinyl siding on furring strips. They want it to be right directly against the sheathing because it helps the uh, vinyl siding be more wind resistant. Yeah, otherwise it's really gonna gonna wave out if you've got it spaced on furring. Um, everything else seems good to me. What do you guys think? Good assemblies. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think with the the zip R sheathing, I did talk to my local uh, lumber guy about a project that we have coming up where we want to use zip R. Uh, right now, four by eight sheets of the R6 are about the only thing that's reliable uh, as far as being able to get it. I'm not sure where Chris is, how reliable it's going to be, especially in the quantity that you it's, would It's uh, upstate New York, uh, as I recall. Yeah, Binghamton area. Um, is that so. enough insulation in your climate, Andrew? Ian, it's not, right? You can't use... Uh, R6 as your, your exterior insulation, it's not going to do uh, dew point control, correct? Yeah, I think it needs to get to R10, maybe yeah. R12. Yeah, it's, it's a little short. And then I would, I also question the open cell foam because I think he's paying a premium uh, price for a, a material that's not going to do much better than any of the other. No, because you have to tape all the zip seams and that's that's your air barrier so the the foam uh you know is not any better insulating it is a good air seal but you have a air control layer well, you elsewhere. called out open cell though yeah you called out open cell specifically as opposed to closed cell so it's not gonna quite have the same characteristics of closed cell in that assembly as far as our value or its ability to air seal um anything else we'd change No, I think you got to put drywall up, right? You can't, can't avoid that. <laughs> uh, That's our primary air control layer in most assemblies on the interior, right? Yep. Yeah. Uh, other questions regarding below-grade insulation. Oh, did I get to all this stuff here? Yeah, okay. So um, another uh, insulation material would be fine, but I do think you're going to want to check to make sure you're using enough of it. I don't think R6, uh, where you're at, Chris, is going to be enough. I would also um, look at, uh, since he is concerned about the overall cost, I did suggest that he looked into using a basic cheat good like CDX and then doing uh, some kind of a WRB, Blue Skin, Sega, Benjamin Opdyke, whatever, over that, and then EPS uh, outboard of that, an insulation that could stay cold and uh, you'd have to put the... Uh, vinyl siding on with the longer nails, but I, I believe there's provisions for that in the vinyl siding install. What about window and door openings? I'm presuming they're gonna be at the same plane as the insulation layer, or are they gonna be in, in, in set? I would assume for the style of home he's talking about building that they would be in the uh, insulation layer, which would require some type of uh, window buck or furring around the uh, window opening to get it out into the EPS or foam layer. So we would put some kind of framing, uh, you know, behind yeah. the nailing flange that was the same thickness as the foam, right? And we're going to take yeah. a little energy hit there, but we're going to have a solid attachment for the window. Right. And that's, it's a lot uh, easier to flash than at that point uh, before you put the insulation on. 
Uh, since it is a new build, should should I insulate the exterior b- basement continuously as opposed to interior insulation? Boy, this is an age-old question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyone want to summarize the uh, the concerns here? So, for what I suggested to him was to do what I did, which I'm I'm really happy with the performance of, uh, which is the waterproofing membrane on the exterior of your foundation with dimple mat, with a good drain tile uh, system that's covered by a lot of clear stone, cover the clear stone with the geo textile fabric to keep dirt from getting into it and just really eliminate or drastically reduce the ability of water to get into your foundation and then do all of your insulation on the interior. And Why I did, did you go inside, Ian? Uh, I was really concerned about water because of where we are. Uh, and I was really concerned about the clay soil not allowing it to drain very well. And I couldn't find uh, an assembly that I liked that mixed that type of drainage system with insulation in a way that just didn't seem counterintuitive to me about what I was actually getting out of the insulation. So I brought all of that to the inside. So I have my foam board on the walls and then that connects to the foam board that's underneath my basement slab. And my walls are built out in front of that foam board with mineral wool insulation in the stud cavities. And bringing the insulation inside solves the problem of finishing the above grade portion of exterior insulation, which is a huge hassle for everybody. We've seen some good methods to do that from uh, podcast listeners. Um, But that is that is a complicating factor. Yeah. And the method I used is something that is a kind of mashup from many different building science places that uh, when it came down to me having to decide what I was going to do uh, and just seeing the amount of water uh, in my lot and in the basement hole, it just seemed like the best way to go to me. Um, Something else to think about, Chris, I I believe it's Tremco's uh, tough and dry system, which is an exterior uh, spray applied waterproofing system that they then use um, fiberglass uh, rigid insulation on the exterior and uh, that's what amounts to Ian's drainage uh, layer, mm-hmm. right? It's, it, yep. it, it, it provides free drainage and insulation. Um, once yeah, again, should, hiding the top of it is the obstacle there. Yeah, I should add that a, a big driving factor in me choosing the uh, products that I used was my ability to drive to a concrete supply house and put them Get on it. the back of my truck. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and you could do that work yourself. Uh, it's yep. not hard and it has to be correct, right? Yep. And it's, it's pretty methodical. It was, uh, it was not a, a fast moving process to do well. Uh, okay. Insulated under the basement slab. Yes. Uh, <laughs> my current thought is rigid foam, at least R10. Yes. Uh, that's correct. Insulate the basement walls. Uh, my understanding is it may be best to insulate the outside of the foundation with rigid foam. Interior finished areas could be supplemented with cavity insulation. We, we talked about that. A drop ceiling f- seems like a no-brainer within the finished sections of the basement, right? Well, We've Patrick, talked about you love, that. You love yeah. removing drywall and putting it back yeah. up, so <laughs> just drywall the ceiling. Yeah. I think it looks better. I'm not a fan <laughs> of drop ceilings. It makes me feel like I'm back in school, which was never a comfortable spot for me. <laughs> the other thing that I pointed out to Chris as well is the uh, an, an attractive drop ceiling is really, really expensive. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and not like 10 bucks a square foot. Yeah, it's yeah. nuts. Yeah. By the time you get to thin, uh, slim grid and you get to nice tiles or, uh, you know, even some kind of drywall based tile that then looks like a drywalled ceiling. It's just really expensive and it's a new home. So hopefully you're going to have a few years without uh, maintenance that's going to require drywall cutting and patching. Take freaking pictures of everything (laughs) before you drywall it and it'll be pretty easy to make changes or fix stuff when, you know, down the road. 
uh, fresh concrete releases a lot of water, not to mention joint compound, etc. How can we permit the basement concrete and other materials to release their moisture within the finished sections of the basement while avoiding moisture problems? Well, dehumidification, uh, temporary dehumidification is often required in modern builds. Is that something you guys have to think about, Ian? Yeah. Yep. Using uh, like the Santa Fe dehumidifiers or for my build, I ran my HRV during the build uh, to keep moisture down. And then we had two 48 inch barn fans from uh, Fleet Farm that we ran with the windows open in the house pretty much nonstop. What does that do when it's 90% humidity outside though? Does it make it better? Um, I found that at least when we were doing the concrete and the uh, taping that it did get some, get rid of uh, a fair amount of the moisture, even mm. though it was equally as humid outside. Uh, this, those are all good questions, Chris. It clear to me that you're thinking about this, which is half the battle, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And taking advantage of all the resources too. When he talks about uh, the FHB all access and listening to this, and there's so many other uh, Instagram things to read, people to meet and talk to, and uh, I don't think I'm outside the norm of people who have done this work that are interested in helping others. I think, uh, especially in the high performance building community, there is a, a big push to get as much of this information out to the masses as possible. Do you guys think that Chris is going to be able to find a builder who's comfortable with putting exterior insulation on this structure, for example? And like, are they going to want to deal with vinyl siding over a foam layer and window flashing. It's like, I think it's going to be hard enough to find a good builder to build very conventionally uh, in this climate. Am I, am I wrong? I don't know a lot about the, the Binghamton area. I know it is reasonably well populated. It's not like the, mm -hmm. the North country part of New York state. Uh, but yeah, Jeff is shaking his head. He's like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he, 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 he's in, a, yeah, he's out an hour outside of Binghamton, basically. He's he's right. fairly rural, so yeah. He, he may find that he has to do uh, some hybrid owner general contracting to get some of this work done. And he's going to have to supervise it, right? I mean, this might be outside of the norm where he's at. And I think he, a lot of our listeners who are building high performance homes in you know much of america they have to steer the ship right he did comment in one of his emails that he is using an architect uh, so hopefully whoever he's using as an architect can can help with this but i do i feel like you know getting your building to that high performance level is really all in the details like you know not just planning but you know on your job site and if it's your home, like, unfortunately, some of that um, falls on you to, like, you know, trust yep. and, and verify. Uh, pay attention to transitions, Chris. <laughs> I hear that over and over again from people who do building um, problem remediation. Like, yeah. it's always where things change. And if he does find himself having to do uh, general contracting work himself, it's not just the transition in building materials, but it's transition between trades because he may end up with a, a separate exterior insulation trade from his siding trade from you know, the guys that build the walls for him. So there's going to be a lot of uh, sticky parts between those people to coordinate. That, as an, a specific example, is a good one because that's nobody's job. Exterior <laughs> insulation doesn't fall in the normal uh, categories, right. right? Right. So he may find in his area that uh, it might be a specialty insulation contractor or even a commercial contractor that ends up doing that work. And they may have no idea how the uh, WRB is supposed to be treated on the, the CDX or zip wall, whatever he uses. Yeah, they might be, you know, exclusively familiar with fastening insulation to light deck or some other right. commercial <laughs> assembly, right? Yep. It's like no relevance to residential building. Yep. Oh, my. Wow. We really got in deep today. I think you guys would agree. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, Pro Talk Live coming up. Check the uh, website for that. Uh, boy, sign up for all access. Um, that was great to hear that that's a. Also, uh, the Pretty Good House book is is coming out this spring. Um, I got my eyes on sort of a last rough draft and it's it's fantastic. Um, I'm, I'm really excited about the book and. Uh, and it's so much of the stuff we talk about a lot on this yeah, show, right? Yeah, it's. Yeah, it it's another great resource um, that will be available very soon. Do you think there's any chance it's going to put us out of business on the podcast, Andrew? <laughs> I, I don't think so. I, you know, as charming as the book is, Patrick, I don't think it's going to be as charming as as this crew. And Jim's got to have something to listen to when he's going between yeah, estimates yeah. and jobs. <laughs> we Absolutely. heard a number of folks that were doing that, right? Uh, well... It's been a pleasure, gents. Unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today. Thanks to Ian, Andrew, and Jeff for joining me, and thanks to all of you for listening. Please remember to send us your comments, questions, and suggestions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com, and please like, comment, or review us however you're listening. It helps other folks find our podcast. Stay safe, everybody. Keep craft alive. Happy building. Keep your insulation dry. <laughs>